When we clamp two plates together, as shown here, we have a bolt that passes through these two plates. I have washers at the bottom and washers at the top. I have a nut and I tighten that nut down to clamp the two plates together. We've already talked about how we must measure the grip length and we assume that there is a frustum distribution that has a center point that may or may not reside at the interface between plates one and plates two. Well, when we tighten this nut down, we are in effect stretching the bolt and compressing the member. So we can represent that as an applied load on the bolt Fi and an applied compression on the member Fi so that we end up with tension in the bolt and that is our equivalent spring constant Kb. Here's our member equivalent spring constant Km. So we're going to have to stretch the bolt and compress the member and they must have equal and opposite loads in them and this Fi is what we call the initial preload. That is the load that we put on the bolt by tightening the nut on the bolt and it is the same load that we put into the member. The difference is the bolt is in tension, the member is in compression. In effect, what is happening is we are compressing the member and we are stretching the bolt and then we fix those things together and we now have a parallel assembly with a bolt and a member stiffness. The bolt has been pre-stretched, the member has been pre-compressed. If we now apply an external load P to this assembly, both the bolt and the member will experience the same deflection delta. So we imagine the following, that we have an external load P applied to the assembly and that this generates a bolt load PB and a member load PM. Now what we know is that the bolt load due to the external applied load would be given by the bolt stiffness times the displacement delta. We also know that the member load would be given by the member stiffness times that same displacement. The external applied load has got to be equal to the load that the bolt is feeling plus, and now I'm going to replace PM by KM delta. But I want to get everything in terms of PB. So I'm going to use the notion that delta is equal to the bolt load divided by KB. So now the external load is going to be equal to the bolt load plus KM over KB times the bolt load. And so the bolt load is 1 plus KM over KB. And if we reorganize that, we find that the bolt load is simply going to be equal to KB over Km plus Kb times the externally applied load P. This means that the load that the bolt carries is a fraction of the external applied load. And that fraction, which is given by Kb over Km plus Kb, is what we call the joint compliance. So the joint compliance is simply given by Kb over Km plus Kb. So the load that the bolt experiences when we apply an external load to a clamped joint is simply a fraction of that external load and the load that the member feels due to that external load is 1 minus C times that external load. Now that isn't the total load that either one of these things are seeing. In fact, the total bolt load FB would be given by the initial preload of the bolt that came about by tightening the nut plus this joint compliance times the externally applied load. So clearly the overall bolt load is increasing as we apply P, but it is increasing with a fraction of the externally applied load P. The total member load is simply given by 1 minus C times P minus FI. So what's happening here is that we have had an initial compression in the member that is being relieved by the application of an external load. At some point, this load could get large enough to completely relieve the compression and then the member force would simply go to zero. And the member is completely unloaded. It cannot carry any additional tensile load. And so it's no longer participating 
in resistance of the external load P. So when Fm goes to zero, all the load is carried by the bolt. That's an important consideration. And what happens is C goes to one and the member load is gonna to go to zero. This equation no longer holds. We no longer have load sharing by the member and the bolt. And so we want to avoid this condition right here. We ask the simple question, what load P completely relieves the member compression? So we're gonna give that load a special name. We're gonna call that load P0. And P0 is found by letting the total member load equal zero. So we know that Fm is one minus C times P minus Fi. If we let Fm go to zero, we get one minus C times P zero minus Fi. And so P zero is equal to Fi over one minus C. Well, that P zero is really P opening. So P zero represents the opening load. That is an important load because the member is no longer participating in the load sharing and all the load is then thrown on the bolt. So we want a factor of safety against opening is simply P0 divided by P. And so the factor of safety against opening, we're going to call it NO, is just given by FI over 1 minus C times P. So that's an important factor of safety, and it is something that you want to put into any spreadsheets that you build for assessing bolted connections. As we continue to develop our factors of safety, we want to take note of all the important variables that we are using when we describe these factors of safety. The first is a preload of the bolt in the member. And remember, we are at this point simply talking about tension-loaded bolted joints. The total external load is applied to the joint, and if we had multiple bolts in that joint, the P that we would be looking at would be the total applied load divided by the number of bolts in the joint. So we are talking about a tensile load per bolt. The variable P sub B is the portion of the load P taken by the bolt. P sub M is the portion taken by the members. The total bolt load is PB plus the initial preload. The total member load is PM minus the initial preload. C is the joint compliance. One minus C is the fraction of the external load carried by the members. And N is the total number of bolts in the joint. Now, in order for us to develop the next factor of safety, we want to look carefully at a stress strain curve for a bolt. And this is a typical example of a stress strain curve for a high quality bolt where we plot the stress against the strain and identify several important features. First, there's the linear elastic region with the slope of which is the elastic modulus of the bolt. In the stress strain curve, we identify the ultimate strength of the bolt, the yield strength, and then a proof load where the proof strength is always less than the yield strength and is generally on the order of 85% or so of the yield strength. And so we end up using this proof strength to develop simple load factor of safety for the bolt. So now we're going to go back and consider that the bolt load is just equal to C times P plus F I. And so if I wanted to find a bolt stress, I would take that bolt load and I would divide it by a cross-sectional area. And the prudent cross-sectional area to use is the threaded area of the bolt. So this is CP plus FI over AT. And a proof strength factor of safety would simply be the ratio of the proof strength to the bolt stress. Well, that's just CP plus FI divided by AT. We take the AT up in the numerator, and this gives us a proof strength factor of safety. And that is another important factor of safety that would appear in all of your calculations and if you build spreadsheets in all of your spreadsheet calculations. Now there's another thing that we can do and that is we can identify a proof load factor of safety which we denote by N sub L. To do that we simply multiply the load C N L times P plus F I and we compare that 
to the proof strength, and then we solve for NL, and we find that NL is going to be equal to this proof strength times the threaded area minus the preload divided by C times the external applied load, and that becomes a load factor of safety. Again, this is another important factor of safety that we will use in our calculations. In order for us to find the proof strength or proof load factors of safety, we need the proof strengths of the bolt materials. I am going to be using tables 8, 9, 8, 10, and 8, 11 from the Shigley textbook to find these proof strength properties for different grades of bolts. I show here table 8, 9, which is the SAE specification for bolts, grade numbers 1 through 8.2. And the important thing is that these these heads of these bolts will have markings on them that correspond to the grade numbers. You'll notice that grades 1, 2, and 4 have no such markings, so you just got to figure that one out. But from grade 5 to grade 8.2, we do have head markings, and those head markings correspond to the grades. Those grades give you the proof strengths, and you'll notice that the proof strengths are always less than the yield strengths for any of these grades. Those are English units. If you go to metric units and the ISO standards, then you will see that metric uses a much more logical direct grade marking on the head of the bolt. And it corresponds to these grades, which list the strengths, the proof strengths in megapascals. And again, you'll notice that they are always less than the yield strengths, regardless of which grade we use. But as you increase the grade, you're gonna be increasing the proof strength. Now you have to figure out what your initial preload is going to be in the bolt. And the way you find that preload is really dependent upon the calculations that we did for square Square threaded or Acme threaded power screws and that is the torque required to get a specific load is related to the nominal diameter and a factor K, which is a torque factor that allows you to specify how much torque you would have to apply to achieve that preload. Mind you, these are not very accurate. So this is just a means of relating torque to an initial preload in the bolt, but they're not going to be accurate. Generally, we use K equal point two if we don't have more specific information. Table 815 in Shigley gives you a number of torque factors K for different bolt conditions.